as human beings, we are, you know, naturally curious people who are typically keen to uh, engage with the world around us and to express ourselves for others to see value in us and for us to see value in others and to be able to socialize and participate in the world in some meaningful way. And I think AI, you know, offers a real opportunity to, uh, to give us a lot more of that in our lives. This is Velocitize Talks and I'm Eric Jones. I'm here with Dr. Chris Brower, who's the Director of Innovation at the University of London. Dr. Chris, it's great to have you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. One of the areas, and obviously you oversee a whole range of different you know, technology areas, um, but one of the areas I wanted to explore with you today is AI. Um, you, know, you had a comment in a recent publication, or maybe it was in, in uh, uh, a broadcast uh, interview that you did recently, where you talked about the power of AI to amplify humanity. Um, I wondered if you could uh, do a little bit of a double click on, on that. Yeah, I think it's a really important thing. I mean, the conversation has been about the, the likelihood of AI dehumanizing people. And, and it's kind of obvious. There are some very simple applications of that as we start to see, you know, I was talking about systems that are in place in call centers, for example, that are monitoring the tone of voice and the method of engagement of people as they're responding to calls. And there'll be a little AI down in the corner of the screen that is is constantly coaching and monitoring the human being and advising them to uh, be more empathetic, to uh, uh, show more energy levels, to... And so you have a situation where people are working in collaboration with an AI system, but which could be perceived as asking the human being to be more like a human machine, to be monitored the way we would have maybe anticipated people monitoring the machines for efficiency and optimizing their, their behaviors. Uh, here we have the reverse happening and we have AI being introduced into the workplace and, and a change in the way that that works. And the collaboration is more about the AI overseeing, in fact, managing the human being and, and dictating the terms by which the human being uh, behaves. But what we see uh, you know, beyond those kinds of simple optimization efficiency examples is something else, and that is AI has a real potential to free up time. And fundamentally, at the core of that is, are we imaginative enough are we capable of reconceiving that we may get our humanity back, that for years we've been asked to behave a bit like machines because the technology hasn't been mature enough or ready enough to supplement our work and to take over what we typically think of as like routine, administrative, repetitive tasks that can really grind down the psyche, make it very stressful at work, relentless, uh, always uh, unfinished. Um, this kind of lifestyle that people you know, have been quite reticent to participate in, in all kinds of avenues of work, uh, you know, is being addressed by these AI systems. And as it begins to fill that void of those kinds of tasks, it's freeing up time for people to pursue more human tasks. And a lot of the time people thought, um, you know, that was going to be oh, to be creative, for example, or to, uh, to be very innovative. In most cases, in our experience, it, it often means spending more time with your family or, or just being able to recharge your batteries or being able to, uh, to spend more time on the challenges that are intriguing for you. And that's what I mean by amplifying your, your humanity. As human beings, we are you know, naturally curious people who are typically keen to uh, engage with the world around us and to express ourselves for others to see value in us and for us to see value in others and to be able to socialize and participate in the world in some meaningful way. And I think AI you know, offers a real opportunity to, uh, to give us a lot more of that in our lives. How about um, the other end of the spectrum from you know, re replacing the routine? How do you think it's gonna unlock greater creativity in, in humans? So we have a really, really big challenge. One of the sort of, uh, you know, I conduct an, a huge amount of research and one area that I was really startled by was a, was a large scale McKinsey study that was conducted uh, earlier this year where they looked at the a number, percentage of US jobs that required the median level of creativity. And that number was 4%. So uh, what's that essentially saying is that 4% of the jobs in the US currently require the average level of human creativity that we have and we're able to express. So um, that, is, that is quite significant because 
um, you know, if you look at the World Economic Forum or any of the UNESCO studies or any of the large scale studies that have said, you know, what are the 10 skills that people are going to need more of to be successful in an augmented world where automation is playing all these critical roles. Curiosity is, uh, uh, creativity is always, you know, at or near the very top of that list. And yet here we see a very, very thorough study, um, which the way they conduct a study like that, for example, is they take a job and um, we have databases that, that have the tasks that are performed in those jobs highly detailed. And there's many databases like that. ONET is probably the most popular one. But it, it's able to demonstrate for you that you can then go through those tasks and say, is this task a creative task? Does this task require creativity? So they can go through any job, whether it's a teacher or a marketer or a manager or anything else, and they can look at all the tasks that person performs on a regular basis in that job and give it a, a effectively a creativity quotient that they can then look later. Only 4% of the jobs require the median level of creativity. So we don't have a situation where if we free up people's time, as I was just describing, that time can then be applied to more creative work because there isn't actually any creative work for people to do currently that they would need to be uh, occupying if they continue to perform jobs as they're currently constructed. And so what we see here is the need for not just uh, uh, optimization and efficiency, making us more human, giving us a chance to express our humanity, getting the machines doing what they're doing, but a redefinition, a reinvention of the notion of work, which enables people to be more creative. There's a, there's a desperate need for creative and innovative solutions to help us uh, uh, escape what is really a stagnant uh, environment globally around, uh, around new opportunities and problem solving and so on. And you know, we have a chance to address that, but we need to then say, okay, we freed up 30% of your time in your job, rather than just saying, let's take that 30% and apply it to the existing tasks you're currently performing. You, for example, someone like me, you've now got 30% more time to spend on research, which you love, and you're not now you know, uh, needing to repetitively answer frequently asked questions that are coming in from students enrolled in your course, because you've got a bot that does that. Great, but I don't just want to do research as I've always done it. I want an opportunity to be more creative in the methods that I employ and the way I think through those challenges. And that needs to free up new ways of thinking. And often that will involve turning back again to the AI. Like for example, you know, up until two years ago, I never did any research with bots or with AI systems. Now I don't do any projects that don't incorporate typically some element of that. We're gathering data from bots. We're able to analyze. We have a lot of predictive analytics running across and machine learning algorithms that look across massive data sets. We have the capacity to consume and absorb huge amounts of information that was never made possible to us before, which means we can ask different questions of the data and we can seek different kinds of solutions, which allows us to express our creativity in ways that we hadn't previously. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that folks have about AI today? I think, I think you know, the level of maturity that we're at, it, um, you know, it, where you see a very, very strong business case right now is around robotic process automation. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, it, it, it is the simple scripted, if you can imagine macros in Excel, uh, this is just another kind of variant of that where you can develop these scripts to perform repetitive routine business functions. It's not AI. It doesn't have any learning component typically. It doesn't have any intelligence. When I talk about AI, I think of it as uh, you know being able to solve problems in a diverse range of environments. These kinds of scripts aren't designed to do that. They're designed to perform a very specific function in a very controlled and executed way. The business case for that is fantastic. The business case for AI at the moment, where you have a learning system and you work with it, we aren't mature enough yet to, to harness the power of that kind of capability. And so when people are looking at AI, they're typically thinking of, it's AI that's replacing jobs. At the moment, it, it's RPA that is absorbing uh, tasks in the workplace. And AI is doing, there's no jobs that I can think of at all that would be able to be replaced wholesale by an AI system because you know, people understand what matters and AI systems don't yet know what matters. So I think, you know, the idea that the AI is somehow challenging our humanity in that way, I think is, is not correct. Uh, and also that we're sort of, people are adopting AI systems again, to a large scale, you know, AI systems are stuck in proof of concept at the moment and they haven't scaled and they're challenged to scale because we haven't been able to think in an augmented way where we collaborate with these technologies instead of you know, running in parallel with them where the machine does 30% of the tasks and we do 70%, but we don't actually do any of them together. That, uh, 
that's the current state to a large extent. And I think there's a lot of room to think in an augmented way and to design ways of work and things we want to do that get a lot more out of AI and, and really aren't part of this sort of conversation about job loss or fear. So uh, talking a little bit about uh, you know, getting a lot more out of AI, you just recently concluded a study that you did with WP Engine on AI. And uh, one of the things that you found is to unlock the greatest value out of AI systems, you actually have to begin with values. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what drew you to that conclusion? Yeah, I think it's a very important uh, concept. It's one that, you know, I, I talked again about the business cases that are succeeding right now. Most of those are not what I would think of as things that can afford competitive advantage over the long term. These, these are ways in which you can, in the near term, optimize and make more efficient business processes, but they're easily reproduced. There's no, there's no constraint on uh, adoption and indeed, uh, you know, early adopters of those technologies typically are going through the struggles that you would normally go through as you try to figure out how to implement these services. And as they've learned from that, people that are coming in later on that are able to do it much quicker and more efficiently so they can catch up nearly instantly uh, with, a, with a level of investment. And so um, it's not going to be uh, optimization and efficiency that defines the success of AI in organizations. And when we started with that premise, we said, well, then what is it that is going to define it? And that's where you start to get into this concept of, uh, you know, the real business challenges and, and social challenges that organizations are facing. You know, if you think about cybersecurity and the, the threats that it poses to to organizations, to, to our identity, to, to data, to geopolitical landscapes and so on. The challenges of cybersecurity are complex and nuanced and contextualized and, and environmentalized and they require an ethical framework. You have to start with principles when you tackle a topic like that. What are you actually trying to do here, right? Well, are we trying to protect people or are we just trying to protect assets? You know, what is our approach to the thinking around what the value is of data and 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 privacy and security and what are, what do we mean when we talk about those terms? Whose security? Whose privacy are we are we concerned with? Um, a lot of it comes from when you begin to design systems, then you recognize right away that by design, anything by design requires this set of principles upon which the design is based. You have to have certain objectives you're trying to achieve and understand them. Those things come back to values and they come back to ethics. You, your approach is defined by, you know, what it is you're setting out to do in the first place. Then you can measure whether or not you're successful against that. And if your only goal is to, you know, ROI on the investment, uh, completely stripped of any um, principles or ethical framework or whatever, then typically you're going to bump up very quickly against a lot of resistance in, in the current society and cultural mindset around this, it's not acceptable anymore. We've seen the pushback against social media companies. We're seeing the, the issues that are emerging. You have to have a set of values and they have to be transparent and visible and they have to be imbued in everything that you do in order to seek and generate further value and growth in your operations. And I think this generation of technologies that are coming, uh, fueled by AI, are going to be, uh, you know, values-led uh, implementations of value. I was wondering, you know, in the vein of values, do you think as a matter of principle that companies should publish their algorithms and, and make them open? I think there's a, I think that would be an excellent step forward. I think this, uh, you know, there's a couple of issues here. One is this black box notion, which is, you know, we thought was kind of going to go away. Um, you know, when you see an algorithm that's, uh, you know, racist or gender biased or whatever, um, and maybe it's learned to be racist or gender biased based on historical data sets that it's analyzing, whether that's somebody trying to analyze, you know, parole uh, conditions and whether somebody should be available for it or not, or uh, an HR algorithm that's trying to filter candidates or any of these kinds of things. Um, we often see that after the fact, after the system's been allowed to run for quite a period of time, this black box factor starts to come in and the people that have ownership and responsibility for that algorithm are unable at that point to explain the decisions that are being taken by the system because it's a combination of 
the data that was initially designed in the way that the algorithm was going to gather and what the learning system has begun to uh, uh, acquire and adopt. And now when we see reinforcement learning systems, they're even more complicated where, you know, the, the learning of a system, you know, if I want to learn about airport security and what's the best way to secure an airport, I can either, you know, train and supervise a system on best practices around airport security in all regards and, and let it, you know, slowly and incrementally make improvements as it gets exposed to different data sets and so on. Or the same way you train a system to learn about Pac-Man and how to play Pac-Man, you can ask that system to learn about airport security, set the conditions and the rules of airport security in place and let it run. And as such, you know, the algorithm itself is, is updating and transforming uh, in a much more fluid manner through a reinforcement learning technique instead of a supervised one and we see a, a completely different outcome. So in so far as organizations could claim to have control over the, uh, the algorithms and, and manage and design them, it's very important that they be very transparent around that. But this is moving so quickly now that we're starting to see conditions where it's more like the principles through which you design this system will have a much greater impact on the outcomes of what it's, you know, what is it meant to achieve? What's the goal of the system starts to become the ethical responsibility that should be clear. You know, if you're trying to maximize profits from every single individual and you're using a personalization algorithm to do so, you should be transparent about that. What the actual algorithm is doing is then the business of the data scientists who are specialists in tweaking and optimizing it and also in a reinforcement learning the business of the machines and the algorithms themselves to self-improve and, and adapt and adopt. But what's the goal in the first place I think is really, really a, an important distinction. And I think if we accept that in a capitalist system there's going to be goals which are to maximize revenue and profit, um, we need to be super clear about that because uh, now you see lots and lots of examples where people are doing that, but they're not saying they're doing that. And um, it's creating a lot of distrust and a lot of uncertainty about what exactly these algorithms are doing and what they're meant to be doing. Maybe they're doing exactly what they were designed to do in the first place, and people should just be a lot clearer about that. That's awesome. Thank you, Dr. Chris. That was Dr. Chris Brower, the Director of Innovation at the University of London.